It sometimes seems that one function of the United States is to supply a name that comes at the end of slogans like down with U.S. imperialism and of chants like death to the Americans, as in this demonstration on terror and last June. The Shah was gone and the mullahs, Muslim religious teachers, had taken power under the Ayatollah Khomeini. They arranged this demonstration. Although the anger and the frustration had been festering for years, the revolution took many by surprise, including the President of the United States. Thirteen months before the Shah fell, President Carter offered this remarkably unprophetic New Year's toast. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. This is a great tribute to you, Your Majesty, and to your leadership, and to the respect and the admiration and love which your people give to you. What the United States gave the Shah, aside from flattery, was military might. Mr. Carter was continuing a policy conducted by five American presidents before him. In 1972, President Nixon supplied the weapons to make Iran the policeman of the Persian Gulf. This was the Nixon Doctrine, which relied on one strong nation to safeguard a region. The Doctrine's critics say it squandered billions and contributed to the Shah's fantasy that Iran was the world's next great power. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger thinks there was no choice. The Soviet Union had just made a massive arms deal with Iraq and was pouring large quantities of the most modern equipment into Iraq. I had already had an arms arrangement with Syria. In some way, these forces had to be counterbalanced. The judgment of the administration in 1972 was that Iran could counterbalance the radical forces. And for a period of seven years, it did. The Shah's greatest value was in the Strait of Hormuz. Half the world's oil passes through this crucial choke point. The Shah policed it for 25 years. In 1953, newsreels around the world showed the Shah returning to power through a military coup. Crown Prince Abdullah greets the Shah as he lands at Baghdad Airport after a seven-hour flight from Rome. Here he was to remain overnight as the guest of King Faisal before completing the journey to Tehran. Meanwhile, in Tehran itself, all stood ready to welcome the return of the Shah after the dramatic development in events which first compelled him to flee and then led to a royalist coup d'etat in which Mossadegh was arrested. If they had realized that it was the uh, an American-supported movement, oh, we could have been in quite a lot of trouble. Kermit Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's grandson, was the CIA man who plotted the overthrow of Iran's prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, in 1953. Mossadegh had offended the Western powers by nationalizing the oil fields, then owned by the British. Our very competent agents had started a movement they led a very large and constantly growing mob up the avenue on which the American embassy was at one end and Mossadegh's house was towards the middle of town. And they went right by the American embassy and the CIA building, which was next door, gave us considerable encouragement from this side. There was a terrific turnout for the Shah when he came back to Tehran. It was quite a strong popular demonstration. Mr. Roosevelt, when this plan for a coup took shape, it was concealed from the outgoing president of the United States, Harry Truman. Did he not know about the CIA's involvement? It was Alan Dulles' decision, and he simply felt that there was no need to discuss it with anyone other than the incoming Secretary of State and the incoming President. Every administration, every new administration, wants its own thing. And Foster Dulles was enabled to regard this as his own thing. And he did, and he enjoyed it very much. 
You had a million dollars in cash to run the coup, right? Now that's right. And we used about $60,000 of it. That was all. Are you saying that $60,000 was all it took? Yeah. I don't know what, where the money went. And I didn't ask because uh, it was so damn little that, uh, that no one was going to ask me any questions. All they asked me was, how the dickens did you get away with spending so little? In the long run, the price turned out to be high. Many Iranians believed that the Shah had returned with Western strings attached, that this was the beginning of what some called 25 years of American occupation. By 1978, almost 40,000 Americans had moved in, most of them military and civilian technical advisors and their families. The life was easy, the pay was good. They might almost have been living in an affluent American suburb. It was a Christian and Western oasis in an Islamic country. Most of the Americans, almost all of them, they, they were living in um, the, um, the best apartments, the best places in the city. And they always had the ability to live highly comfortably. And the poor people, you know, most of the people didn't like that. I saw, like, an American in a store, I would say, listen, you're taking my food, you're taking my, my right. It is a distressing irony that as Iran grew wealthier, the poor grew hungrier. Half of Iran's population lives in rural areas, where farming is primitive and water is scarce. In spite of that, Iran was once self-sufficient in food. In the Shah's time, possibly because of the emphasis on industrial development, Iran became a food importer. Today, the situation is worse. Food imports have tripled this year to at least $9 billion. They swallow nearly half the country's income from oil. It was the oil income that triggered the revolution. It smashed traditional family and social arrangements by pulling people off the land and into the cities. In the cities, squalor combined with anger and inflation, a recipe for revolution. Again, Henry Kissinger. What was not understood was the political changes that would be inevitably associated with such a dramatic transformation of a backward society which was moving into the modern era in a 10-year period with a process that had taken nearly a century in Western Europe. That is a criticism that is and that one should reflect about, the lack of understanding of the impact of economic change on political changes. That is a lesson we ought to learn for the future. Half of Iran's new wealth wound up in the hands of 10% of the people. Richest of all was the Shah himself. His beginnings were fairly modest. His father, who created the Pahlavi monarchy in 1921, was an army colonel. But he called himself King of Kings and the Pahlavi dynasty was arrogant, repressive, and corrupt, weaknesses largely discounted by American intelligence. This report by a House subcommittee criticized the CIA and State Department for insensitivity to deep-rooted problems in Iran. The subcommittee said that intelligence and analysis were weak and that unfavorable assessments of the Shah tended to be downplayed. The CIA's political analyst for Iran from 1968 to 73, Jesse Leaf, says that happened to his assessments. The agency has a lot of people publishing for a very small audience. And uh, my reporting would go uh, to the president, secretary of state, and uh, policymakers. I remember distinctly writing in the early 70s about the Shah's megalomania and delusions of grandeur his feelings he was a world power and the danger that this presented to United States policy. And was told in no uncertain terms such reporting was not going to be published. It was not U.S. policy to criticize the Shah as I was doing. This was against a normal established policy toward Iran and the Shah. The question is asked whether the CIA failed. And to some extent the answer has to be yes. But in fairness one has to point out that a revolution couldn't have gotten started if the person most concerned, namely the Shah, had not, if his intelligence services hadn't failed as well. 
The Shah's intelligence was gathered by his secret police, Savak, which the CIA set up and the CIA and Israel helped to train. During the revolution, demonstrators destroyed Savak headquarters. Savak spied on and tormented those who opposed the Shah. One of its tools was torture. These are descriptions of some of our brightest and most promising young men of this country who for the first time dared to stand against the dictatorship. Many of them died directly under torture. Uh, some of them uh, were made to commit suicide. Hedayat Martin Daftari, a leader of the liberal opposition, is on Khomeini's wanted list. During the Shah's regime, he helped parents of young people who had vanished. The information has not been found about some of them. Some of their graves are not known. Uh, and what is important to a family is to find a grave to make sure that he's dead. This is just one small drop against an ocean of sufferance, an ocean of atrocities, an ocean of crimes committed by the old regime of Iran, which was highly supported, highly guided, and highly accepted by the United States. <laughs> the uh, average Iranian linked the United States with the oppressive governing elite of Iran, and uh, which is why uh, there's so much hostility there now to, toward Americans. NBC News correspondent Richard Hunt talked to some of the mourners. How was he killed? Uh, he, he killed by the officers, you know. Murder, yes. The United States government give the Shah plane, bomb, Carter. He is the right hand of the Shah. He helped him. Of course. Yeah, yes. Murder. <laughs> In exile in France, from which he ran the revolution, the Ayatollah Khomeini exploited the feeling against the United States, which he has called a wounded snake. While Khomeini was in France, ambassador to Iran William Sullivan recommended making contact with him. The decision was no. The State Department uh, agreed to send a man to be in touch with him. I had proposed that we be in touch with him. Uh, that proposal was vetoed, and so no direct contact has ever been had, as far as I know, between the United States government officially and the Ayatollah directly. We did talk to a number of his acolytes and a number of his assistants, but uh, there has been no direct contact with the Ayatollah. Now, whose veto was it? It came in the name of the president. If contact had been established with the Ayatollah, would that have annoyed the Shah? No. Uh, the Shah had been aware that we were going to make the contact and had approved it. Do you have any idea then why the move was vetoed? No, I don't. Had we been able to make direct contact with the man who obviously felt some of the direst things about the United States, he might have been able to see where we had a certain national interests in the preservation of the same sort of Iran that he would like to preserve. It was my first experience in a genuine revolution. This was a revolution that began with the use of street violence, demonstrations, arson, every pertinence of offensive Western civilization as the Islamic extremists saw it was put to the torch. The street violence uh, involved uh, many of the young leaders of those actions, I believe, had uh, learned some of their experience when they were college students in the United States during the days of Vietnam protest because they copied those examples. Very well organized groups. The young Iranians who had never had their hands on a rifle before just became fascinated with the uh, 
experience of being able to shoot the rifle into the air. They were unified only on one negative conclusion, and that was that the Shah had to go. The leader of the so-called first government of God was thought by many to be God himself. With Khomeini in power, Iran became an Islamic republic and joined the radical Arabs of the Middle East in opposing Israel. Oil to Israel was cut off, and Khomeini said that the revolution would not be complete until the Palestinians had a homeland. One of his first visitors was Yasser Arafat of the PLO, which had taken over the Israeli embassy. It was not a time for foreigners to be in Iran, especially Americans. The United States Embassy was the only embassy in Tehran to be overrun. Even before that happened, 35,000 Americans pulled out. The gentleman is saying that we are very proud, that very pleased that we're chucking them out. They've been here very long and they've been sucking our blood. The center of power in Iran today is the holy city of Qum because Khomeini is there. Islamic law is enforced by revolutionary guards. Khomeini wants Iran transformed into a puritanical medieval state. The new laws are decreed by a secret revolutionary committee answerable only to Khomeini, made up largely of mullahs like these. There has been a regression to the past Newly won women's rights have been lost, and most women are now back under their shadows, their veils. Iran's economy has come to a standstill. These villagers have pitched tents outside unfinished abandoned apartments, hoping to move in. But that is unlikely. Before the revolution, construction was the country's liveliest industry. Tehran especially was a boom town. Now, most of the million construction workers are unemployed. The Air Force is crippled by a shortage of spare parts and technicians. All the armed services are deteriorating, with senior officers executed, retired, or in exile. Many of the jobless in Tehran have become street vendors. Of the workforce, perhaps a third, three million, are unemployed. Khomeini may be sitting on a volcano. These disillusioned students are waiting for visas to leave the country. Newspapers are censored when they're not closed down. Opposition parties prohibited. Alcohol and music are poisons to be eliminated. Punishment by the lash is common. Khomeini's enemies call him the Shah with a turban. Despite Khomeini's shortcomings, signs of hatred of the Shah can still be seen. There have been hundreds of executions so far. Most of the victims were associated with the Shah. <laughs> Under Khomeini, there has been rioting again in Tehran, with Khomeini as the target. The issue on this day was press censorship and angry leftists were in the streets. The next day, the Khomeiniites were in the streets in reply. Again, Ambassador Sullivan. These people are going to have to figure out what they're going to do for the future. They're far from having determined that yet. Unfortunately, there are so many weapons in the hands of so many diverse groups that I feel that there will be internal turmoil in Iran for some time to come. Turmoil there is among such minorities as these Arabs of Khuzestan in the south. They virtually destroyed the Shah by shutting down the oil fields and threatened to close them again. The minorities want self-rule. The Kurds in the north are fighting to get it. I think it is, it's a very difficult thing. I think that perhaps it is the most, the most important problem the revolution faces. If the government doesn't give them some kind of self-determination, what will happen in future is separatism. Separatism is a mild way of putting it. 
Civil war is a possibility. Oil production could be ended. The country could be torn apart. Even without that, there is no cheerful prospect for the United States. The oil is a political weapon as much as a commercial one. We don't hide that one. This is not something, it is idealistic and uh, to say, no, it is not. Really, whether this is disaster for the Americans or not depends on how the American administration, how the American establishment, the elites, they want to take this revolution. What I would ask Secretary Vance uh, or any American to do, keep out of our country and we will run it ourselves. The time of Bonanza is over. The time, the way that they were uh, dealing with the Shah's administration is over. They cannot have that anymore. The time of Bonanza is over. Keep out.